feet of wall space this way to, to put them up. So the future is going to be this this way. So is this a one of a kind or is this an existing? One of a kind. All these are one of a kind. Okay. So this isn't done on a press. It's done on the press, but it's not running through the press. It's not locked up. Yeah. And for me, and for me, I can lock things up and run them through the press. For me, I'm hand printing these, so I ink the ink the block and stamp it by hand, and I, I get a lot of the beautiful noise, which I really is endemic to the the process. And I don't want to kill all that, so that's why these have the beautiful rough feel to me. Just a big part of the process. But uh, I'm a junker at heart. And once I get into things, and yeah, I don't know when to quit. I've killed a lot of good stuff over the years. <laughs> I'm like every other lazy painter you've ever met in your life, and I, you know, I, I use ink every day, and I put it in little uh, yogurt cups. So pretty much, what I have laying around is my palette for the day. Other than you know, white, black, yellows, when you know you want something, but. Pretty much, I kind of work with what's handy because you don't want to waste things. And so uh, sometimes I want to get more muted. Sometimes I want some bright and pop. That was a great pink. I really like that stuff, the salmon color. And so they might last for two sessions. Normally when I'm working on things, you know, these are like paintings. It's oil-based ink. And you can only print so long, you've got to let it dry. And so in the spring when the sun's hot, in the summer, I can take them out back, and the sun will blast these things dry in a couple hours. But this time of year, it takes three days in between sessions. So I find myself working on maybe 12 of these at a time. And I can work on one for a bit. You've got to put it aside, and I can work on another one. And so I like the way they get convoluted in my mind, and I, oftentimes I don't know where they're going. But, and then you start 12 more, and yeah, I've got some that have been laying around for maybe six months now, and I can't. I'm kind of stuck on them. So it seems like it all comes around. You just got to let everything live in its own time space. But, you know, you have that dream at night. You're like, damn it, that's what I'm going to do. So wherever things come, you just try to stay open to how it's going to come to you. Can you talk about your inspiration for the press? I've been just telling crazy stories for, you know, 25 years. I've been a, I used to call myself a social smartass because I would make funny posters and a sense of humor was a big part of my, always my work. Um, I developed my story tree series, which you'll see some of those posters in the bin in there, which were, I called them word paintings. And they were, these were originally big story tree prints. You'll see the hint of a big type press in the sheet. They were 10 feet long. But I would be home at night carving wood blocks to print the next day for a job, and I would have the TV on at home. So I was, I was hearing what was coming through that, through the airwaves, but I couldn't watch it. But if I heard a sentence I liked particularly, I'd write it down. Before I knew it, I had 400 pages of that to deal with. So I turned that into a story tree series, which was just TV, TV poetry. But it was beautiful walls of just pure type. And I, and I like those prints. There may be one on the table in the back, back there, and some in the bin. So I'm repurposing that paper into the robots now because... I don't want to throw the paper away. Can you and this. Passage from this, so our online viewers can get a little grasp of what's happening. Oh, for the online guys. Okay, the story for Death Ray Jr. In the year 2170, the mighty Death Ray Jr. returned to Earth to save mankind from the evil Herptron from the Crab Nebula galaxy. The Herptron had developed immunity to the original Death Ray, which consisted of a strong dose of penicillin and antimatter. Death Ray Jr. is packing version X2, which also has Red Bull and Viagra, which will cause, cause delayed backache, bloody stool, blurred vision, and placidosis. Herptron di dies badly. <laughs> you know, now, now it, it, I develop ways of working because I'm always in the shop, like 18, 20 hours a day. And so, from, in, in the daytime, it's always music, you know, playing music. Music is, is your friend when you're doing all these tasks. But at night, I like the TV on because that was where my head was when I was carving and drawing. It's a different, different noise in the background. But now on TV, all you see are the, uh, all these medical things and all these medicines with all these side effects. And I'm like, why in the, the F would anybody take that shit, right? 
death, stroke, and bloody silly. You get all that stuff. That's what awaits us all, right? So I'm, I've been taking notes on that, and I've got quite a bit of notes of side effects, and they're, they're going to find their way into this stuff. So it's all research. It's all research. So here's uh, one of the big robots. which needs a frame. but So they're growing in shape. This one needs another session. It's not done. It's been laying around. It's been laying around for three or four months. And this is like a robot head with a robot body. I was fooling with the idea of a robot within a robot, and some of that goes on in the bigger ones. But I, I, I'm liking the scale and the space. There was a time when this was really clean and sexy and minimal, and I loved it. And I got down on the bottom half of it and started junking shit up because that's what I do. Can't stop. Yeah. And now I've got, to, I've got to deal with it and pull it back together some way or the other. And it might be that I take a, some blue ink and make it an eraser and just clean it back down. But Right? You'll, you'll see it through some of these. And um, I've got four of them framed already at the shop, the big ones. So these two are next to get framed. And a couple more started. So I hope to get... 15, 20 big ones together for a show with all these two. But I like the bigger size. And like I say, going from that poster to this was one thing, and going from this to this is another thing. And so that's what's keeping it, in my mind, you know, fresh and fun. But letting, letting the typography do its thing in a new way, creating a new language with symbols that are language. So what keeps you from, from getting too... Details on Nothing, and that's the problem, you know, because I like to get in there and, you know, the death rays on these two things, I've got 30 plus hours just stamping the two rays. And I, I just try to avoid it, but every now and then I just can't help it because you got to do it. You just got to do it, you know. There's just no rules. There's no rules. So like this here, it's yeah, it's just a little circle. So. I don't, you know, I want to be free, and, and I'm, I'm willing to give it what it wants. And so that's just, it's just time. Yeah. It's quality, quality time. Good therapy. But that, yeah. But, um, but the drawing process doesn't, doesn't like, does it change the, the, the end result? No, no. If you want to go, yeah, sometimes you just got to put it away until you can work on it again, and that's just, yeah. that's just the rule. Because what happens, you just start smearing ink everywhere you go. You lean on it, you get it all over you, and, and you mess it up. So. But at the, at the end, it doesn't matter whether it takes two hours or three days to dry? No. Huh. Now, it's eventually going to dry, but it just wants that time between sessions to, yeah. to be able to go white on black or black on white or blue. or. So get them down to, you know, two colors, three colors, blue, white, and black. You can still do so much with minimal color, which I really like. And some of these, some of the early ones were much more minimal on the color scale. And even this one laid around for a long, long time, and I did not want to junk it up any more than I had to. And I used the little uh, bright teal and silver to seal it off, and I was happy with it. The Galactron there behind Matt. So I was so pleased that I could not maximize that one out because they're they all they all get crazy busy really fast for me. <laughs> When, I, when I'm on a roll. When I'm on a roll. Yeah. So, uh. Do you allow yourself subtraction even though someone's all added generally? Yeah. I do. And uh, a lot of these guys, the, the first batch especially, these guys, I'd work on them all day, you know, and, and get them out in the sun, get them dry. And I'd come out in the morning, and they were all black, red, blue, black, and white. So the blue was the background on most of the early ones. And so I'd come out in the morning if I didn't like it. As a painter, I'd just take the blue on a brayer and go in and erase what I didn't like. And that would let me see it often in a whole completely different way. And they really evolved. And I was trying to break out of the symmetry of these things because they, they, they still stay. There's still a lot of symmetry involved in these, like totem style almost. Like. And, it, and for me, it, it, you know, there's totally a connection to Native American and Inca and, and that that whole thing. And it was unintentional, but it's there. And, and I recognize it early on. And a lot of people always had that to say about them. So trying to break away from that and, and move into crazy directions. So treat it more 
as a painter than, and just getting your mind out of being, you know, my mind is everything I've ever made, I've done in additions. So I have to figure out how to make it and then print it 500 of them or, yeah, or 1,000 of them. Can be limiting as well. Right? right. So, well, no, I can do I can work within that space. Like, I can do anything I want to do. But this really gave me the freedom to change the notions of all that. And I think that's all what we all look for is, you know, we're working within a grid, and then once you can break free of the grid, you're free. But you're still in the grid. But I've, I've taught, I've tried to teach an army of kids how to do that over the years. And I've, but letterpress has come a long way in 25 years. And it was in danger of dying when I started. And there's nobody doing it. So you can look at it now, and you can't swing a dead cat without finding somebody doing it. So that makes me feel really good. And it, it's, it's, it's coming back. The danger is over. When I started, the type drawers were worth more than the type. And all the type was getting dumped because the type drawers were 25 bucks to put your knickknacks in and, at the swap meets. And I rescued a lot of type back in the day that would have otherwise been gone. And now it's all, it's worth, it's worth its weight in gold now. They all wish they had it back, but it's awesome to be here. I know that. And uh, thanks for letting me have my first show in, in California, Matt. This is really awesome. Anybody got anything? What you got? It seems like you have a really good relationship with the way you work and the time frame things take. Have you always had such a relaxed attitude towards that, or is that something? Oh yeah, if if you want to exist, you have to produce things on a on time. And so I've worked on a deadline. You know, yeah. we learned that in college, and it never ends. You can get out in the world, and you got to do things for people want shit by five o'clock. So that that's the deal. But I, I know in, in talking about your own work. Yeah. No, I, I have. There's there's 30 or 40 of these laying around in process, and, and so I've got something to do when, when I have time to do it because I have distractions now and I have business to deal with, which I hate. I hate business. It hates me. But we we deal with each other. But you know, I'm talking to people about this and that. People coming in and and just wherever I can find my time, you just learn to like like everything. We learn how to do it. So, Getting, I'm getting old, man. I'm getting old. Damn it. I, I had crazy energy when I started, man. When I, was, I left college at age 30, and I could work five days without sleep. You know, it's crazy. Now, I really pay the price. Well, you know. Well, he came just, up with a truckload, and he was hoping he brought more so we could fill up the... Uh, I could. I know. We could have. We, could have we, had, we had room for a dozen more. We really did. We had that sign painter show uh, a few months ago as well, and there was a similar working attitude as well of, like, there wasn't that artistic block thing going on. So, like, what am I going to produce? It's like, that's it. It's just like, you don't have the option of not producing necessarily. Those are rich people problems. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. How did you get from the plain background to the, like, textured layers, you know? Oh. You know, I've, I've been printing for a long time, and the, these are called make-ready prints, and it, it, they're registration sheets for things that go, it's, it's a history of things that go through the press. I've got 500 of those laying around, so I can pretty easily put a robot on them now, and they're super cool again, but they're not quite finished as art pieces by themselves. They're just not, uh -huh. but when you get into fine art prints this size, you know, one fingerprint, it's pretty anal crowd, and so when you're doing addition work, you've got a fingerprint on it, forget it. You got you got to repurpose. So everything gets repurposed. But you know, over the years, I, I sold a million make ready prints out of my shop. They're they're all beautiful, and it's I never treated those things as special. I every time I did a job, I'd try to run 20 of them through the press, and they just build up, and you just keep mixing them up, and they turn beautiful eventually. Yeah, for the most part. And they're thinking of like making that. They become one of a kind. Just yeah, they they do. Yeah. Like you have some prints in the shop. Yeah, and I've, I've chopped those things up and made purses and books and things. Out of, I've chopped up some gold over the years. I'd like to have all that back, but, <laughs> you know. When I first came out to California, maybe three, three and a half years ago, I took my first sabbatical, and I'd never had a vacation in 17 years, and I was in the process of closing down the corporation, and I'm like, well, we're trying to figure that one out, so I said, I'm going to take six months and make some art, and then either we'll make this right or tear it down, and we tore it down, but I, they just came out of me playing with letters, and robots seemed to be a perfect 
perfect mix. And, and I like to get into animals and creatures. That's the snow cone, snow cone killer. That's what I call him. So there, there's room for these things to evolve into other things. And like Death Ray is a good example of, of getting away from the blockiness of a robot to uh, more of an organic feel. I'm always wanting to put curves and round things off a bit now. You can leave that one down for a moment and make them feel more friendly. You know, the, everything's on the square, so it's, it's really important to get a curve on things. No, you know, I'm, I'm just, you, you just trust that God puts her hands on things to make them where they want to be and, and roll with it. And then the minute you put something down, then you have to deal with it. So the, the hardest thing is getting something on there. But that's, that's the thing. I, I can just throw some shit on there and let it dry, and then that's what I have to deal with. And then the process of, okay, how do we solve this or, or make it into something? But from the get-go, just be fearless, throw some crap on there. And then that, get, that sets up the, the problem of what do I do with this? For me, that's just a way of working that seems to go. You have to go rummage into your collection to find that curve you're looking for. Oh, oh, I've got it made now. I know where my shit is. I, yeah. Mean, yeah. I mean, I had a shop with maybe a dozen people in it back in the day, and things don't always get put back where they went. And so we had a one-hour rule. If you couldn't find something within an hour, you had to just move on and use something else. <laughs> And there's always that perfect thing, and you're like, damn it, I can't find this. But pretty much now, I'm, I'm pretty good at putting my crap back, and it's, it, it's packed in there tight, too. So for me, I spent, man, you know, out of 17 years, I spent four of those putting up other people's stuff. I had a lot of crap. So now it's, it's, it's nice. You know, the thing about letterpress is a lot of moving parts. You know, I've got a billion pieces of type crammed in there, and spacers and shims and all the stuff that go with it, equipment. So that's why you just don't see it. it it's hard to uh, monetize that. The time you put into getting your collection together and organized, you, you, can, you never get repaid for that. I mean, that's, that's a life's work. Right, so I've got a 20-year place. It's, it's an all tight and stacked upright. It's crammed in a, in a place about this big. You know, so no one knows the amount of work that went into that just to have it there to produce something for you. And I turn away a lot of work in L.A., and as, you know, I, I've, out of 100 jobs, I turn away 97, 98 of them. And I try to explain as much as I want to work for you for 20 cents an hour, as, <laughs> as much as I want to do that, I'm going to pass. I'm going to take a pass. But good luck. You know, because there's a lot of that. Are and, people finding you mostly through word of mouth? You know, they are, and I've had incredible press. I've been in front of 100 million people this year, probably. I, one event was televised to 60 million people for Audi. And so it just blows my mind how, how the, the mainstream of all this is. And I've had just an incredible amount of great press in L.A. And so L.A.'s been very welcoming to me. And, and you know, starting out, I didn't have to start over fresh as, as a kid with nothing. So I, I, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. I wish I'd came here, like I say, you know, 10 years earlier, and it would have been super on. But it's still super on. It's yeah, super on. But I'm more, I try to be more mellow about it now. And I've got some good life coaches here in L.A., some, some old friends who are famous painters in their 70s and 80s. And they're like, just chill the hell out. Just <laughs> slow your roll. Just don't quit worrying about shit. Quit worrying about shit, and it's going to be all right. And so I try to take all that, you know, being from the south, being a hillbilly from the hills of Tennessee, we worry about things. So we Wish we didn't, but we do. Anybody else? What? You know, well, paper is a pain in the ass, and I'm printing on paper, and this is the big roll of arches. So it comes in a roll 42 inches wide, but I, I could make these 30 feet long if I wanted. But I think this is going to be about a good size. Maybe I'll start printing on some canvas where I can fold it and print one half and go back. And maybe they'll stretch into eight feet tall at some point. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where they're going, but I have a bunch of this old paper laying around, so I'm just repurposing it. And I think I can do about 30 or 40 of these guys before I run out. Eight feet square is a good medium size, right? It's, I think it's going to be a good size. I think if I can get these together with these things, it'll change the way I perceive it, too. So, But... 
I always, you know, the, the background, I'm a typographer, and I've worked with type. And, and as a designer, is the backbone of everything. So I just want to keep playing with it and see where I can take it and have the journey and, and, and play with it. But I like that these are one-of-a-kind and hand-stamped things. I don't think anyone's really doing letterpress in this fashion so much yet, and especially at this size that I've, that I've seen. So I feel good about it now, and I, I want to see where it wants to go. But I want to get back to carving wood blocks, and, and I want to do some big wood blocks this size, some big prints. So I'm going to work on these pretty steady till June, June, July, and then shift over and carve some eight-foot blocks again because I miss it. I used to do it a lot. But it's like, you know, I, even as a painter, when I would get away from my painting and go back to it as an artist, when I go back to things, they're never the same. It's changed, and we've changed. And, and there was a time when I was cooking these things out, and I knew where they were going. Shitting them out it was awesome. It was just so good. And, and I was, my head was in that space, and then I come back to it, and it's all different, and you've got to get in there and beat and bang around on it again to find it. And, you know, like every artist, there's a stack of ugly stuff no one's ever going to see. You know, there's some things. There's some things in the attic. So I like now that I, I've got familiar enough with, with these guys that I can make them, even if they do change, they exist, that they still live together in, in the zoo. So. You are incorporating some wood blocks, though, in these prints. Right? It's all wood. I mean, it's like wood cut that you're actually carving. I'm making an odd little shape here and there for these things. You know, a little thing here. These little guys. I'll, 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 when I need a shape I don't have, I'll just stop and carve something. And so I'm trying to introduce some new shapes, like this little uh, wood thing on the top of his death ray. I needed something to activate that little space for me. And so I'm adding some new shapes, and you're right, which I want, I want more things to play with. So in my mind, I've got an idea to actually stop and do a series of shapes that are interchangeable to actually make robots with that are more curves and things that just fit together. So I'm, I'm kind of designing that in my head right now and, and blow them up to a big size. What's cool because you don't really know, is that letterpress or is that like a woodcut that you carved? Like I wouldn't have known that that was something that you made yourself. Like if you get closer to this one, you'll see that he got a new mouth put on him and there was a mouth under that, didn't like it, so I silvered it out and, and, and created a new mouth that worked better for little death ray there. But he had a, I like his underbite. It's more sexy. Uh, All the tough dogs have the underbite. For the, for the example of the top of the death ray, you needed a specific shape. Is there ever a moment where, uh, I mean, you're doing this in a really kind of labor intensive, like painstaking way, and they're very credible just for that reason. Is there ever a moment where you're like, I need this one specific shape? Why not just paint it versus taking the time to carve it? Kind of like, you know, I can I can carve it as fast as I can paint it. Honestly, yeah. I've got a router on a stick that the print shops had. I can, I can draw it on a piece of wood and go over and knock it out and have it ready to print in five minutes. Wow. Really can. But, I, you know, I have some commissions now where they want one piece for some famous people. And I'm like, well, if you just want one, let's just paint it because I don't want to carve a wood block for one piece. And what's the point? I'm like, if you want 10 or 20, then we'll carve a block. But if you just want one, we'll just paint it on wood with house paint and it'll be done. So, but a lot of people want one piece, two pieces, and I'm willing to do it if they want to pay for it, but they never want to pay for it. It's once again, it's two cents an hour, and I'm just like, I'm going to pass. Really want to pass. Well, thank you, Kevin. Well, guys, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just playing. And take the babies home tonight. And next door in our 3D gallery, we have Jeff Hantman, the gentleman here in the monkey uh, shirt. Uh, I encourage you all to go over there and check out his beautiful sculpture print uh, exhibit. And everyone, make sure you get one of the big business cards off the counter. And if you find yourselves in LA or Santa Monica, come visit, and I'll roll out the silver carpet for you and show you around. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Thanks for a great year. It was fantastic. Stay tuned.